You're listening to the Veterans Heritage Hour on the Vets on Media Network. Good morning, Arizona, and welcome listeners from around the globe. My name is Joe Brett. And this is David Lucier. He's phoning in, and this is the Veterans Heritage Hour, and we are honored today to have as our guest uh, Lieutenant General David Friedovich, um, former Deputy Commander of the Special Forces, Special Operations Command, and prior to that, he was the um, Commander of Special Forces Command uh, Pacific. Good morning, General. Good morning, Joe. Uh, such a pleasure having you with us today. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, our, my, your Green Beret buddy, David, is on another assignment here. He's out um, working on veterans housing, but he is calling in and uh, we have calling a... in from an undisclosed location. <laughs> of course. <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> you got to have a big hey, I one. Just wanted to, I just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, welcome uh, the general to the show and let our audience know that uh, this is a man that uh, really is uh, a humorous and humble as he is accomplished. Uh, it's just amazing thing to call. And, uh, and now uh, he appears to be rolling into kind of phase two. So uh, we look forward to uh, getting a, a, a good backgrounder uh, from you, General, and, uh, and uh, talk about maybe some of your future plans. Well, let's start off here now in 1974 at Knox College of Higher Knowledge in Illinois. How did you get there, General? Uh, it's a uh, well, first thing. If if you know, after uh, David's comments, if you could blush on radio, I'm blushing. Right now. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, Knox was a uh, a great school for me. Uh, I'd been playing, you know, high school football, and as we spoke earlier this this morning, you know, if I'd been a little bit taller or a lot taller, I'd been at Notre Dame, you know, bashing heads, but. You know, life is what it deals you in. You know, at five foot ten, about you know, 190 pounds or more, going into college, I knew my limitations, which I think is kind of a you know, a critical part of my character, knowing what you can and cannot do. And uh, I had been looked at by Marshall University and a few other schools, Center College, and a few other schools in the southeast. And I wanted to kind of get away as far as I could. I'd grown up in Fort Lauderdale and uh, born in the South Bend, Indiana. I'd grown up in Fort Lauderdale. And I was just ready to go. So this friend of mine's father was a guidance counselor. And he said, hey, uh, what are your plans? And I go, you know, I want to play, I want to play college football. Man, I want a great education, knowing that I needed a real good education to make your way in the world back in the early 70s. And he said, I think this is a great fit for you. And he told me about Knox. He said two things. He said, their football is terrible. You'll play and start right away. <laughs> and he says, they haven't had a winning season and I don't know how long. And, uh, and I looked them up and that was true. It was uh, terrible football, but they were turning the corner. They were starting to get guys, kids like me from Florida and kids like me from Oklahoma. And they just weren't doing a Catholic Chicago suburb league is where they used to get most of their players uh, in downstate in the farm country. Uh, guys a little bit bigger than Adam that picked up the plow at the point where the capital of Illinois was. It's an old Woody Hayes story. Anyway, uh, you know, I got there and played football, and, and actually we had winning seasons the entire time. Oh, yeah, yeah. We turned the program around, and the two the, the kids behind us actually went to uh, the national championships a couple years later. We told them, we, you know, taught them how to win. And while I was there, you know, I ran into a bunch of guys, very small campus, so you knew everybody. Sure. And uh, the guys that I knew that were really good good people and, you know, good young men, going to be good good men, were in the ROTC department. And they had good instructors there. Well, in so, 1974, that was the, probably the worst time in our military history. It was. The seat of Vietnam, it really Yeah. Was. Yeah. Depleted the military drugs and yeah. racial divide. Actually, I remember going to a uh, <clears throat> my second summer camp before I got commissioned was in Fort Riley, Kansas. Mm -hmm. My first one basic training was at Fort Knox, Kentucky in mm -hmm. 1972, 73, and then did my camp at the end of my graduation period in 74. And I remember seeing bags of marijuana on the field. We were out in the field lanes or tactical stuff. Sure. And, and, you know, it was 
the version. It's almost some kind of like weird flashback that just what you said, Joe, is that it was just it was out of control. And you go, wow, what is going on here? And, you know, guys were going around going short. I'm all through. Yeah. I'm out of here. You know, and you had this feeling that, wow, what am I getting into? And before I went on active duty, I, I matured late as a student at Knox. And I had a real good undergraduate, uh, obviously a very good undergraduate uh, experience. And I asked if I could go to graduate school. And my professor didn't laugh at me. He said, I can get you into a PhD program or I can get you into a uh, master's program at Tulane University. So I took an educational delay, had an RA commission, regular army commission coming up, took an educational delay for two years, got my master's in Tulane University in New Orleans, and some international relations and development in the third world. Oh, great. And I have to tell you, I used both my Knox education and my master's, especially when I was in special forces. Well, that's, that yeah, was your- it was perfectly- Perfect. Yeah. So, you know, took the, took the education delay and went in the Army in uh, late May of 1976. You were an infantry officer. Infantry officer, uh, commissioned in 74, went on active duty in 76, mm -hmm. and uh, went to the basic, uh, infantry officer basic at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. Went to jump school right after that. Did not have time to go to ranger school. Didn't become a ranger. Uh, for a variety of reasons, I guess I almost, I probably won't talk about one reason why I, I didn't, uh, but I was getting married at the end of jump school, made all the first three days of the jump week, which is hard to September. You're always worried about weather and got in my Volkswagen and drove from Fort Benny, Georgia to Chicago to get married that, that weekend, mm -hmm. picked up a hitchhiker. So we could share driving duties with me and drop them off at Joliet to see Elwood and Jay, uh, and Jake, <laughs> the blues brothers. The blues brothers man. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. And then, you know, kept on going. And I think someone even took the, we already had the, we had it stopped the Cook County uh, courthouse, Kathy and myself to get the license, but somebody had taken a blood test for me. Not your blood. Not my blood, but we're good. Well, but, you know, a, it, was, it was, yeah. I passed you know. a urine sample that way to get my flight physical. Well, that's from, different. But from someone know. else, really. So, but somebody <laughs> took a blood, and someone took a blood test. You know, luckily right. it didn't come back pregnant because I think it was a lady. We were just, <laughs> we were just ahead of our time, I suppose. Well, you are special. Oh, special yeah, well, forces. It is unique. Anyway, yeah, well, that's special. So you get it. So you get into the infantry, and you're yeah. you're going to Benning, and you're in jump school, and yeah. you're qualified, and then you get sent to Alaska. We go to Alaska. Yeah, cool. we get we get in the car, we pack up the uh, the the Volkswagen Bug uh, Super Beetle. Uh -huh. We don't have many. Uh, you know, at that point, you're newlyweds. You don't have much stuff. One guy shows up in my in-laws' house to pack our stuff up. He thinks he has a half a day job. It takes him like an hour, and he goes, "That's it." We go, "Yeah," and those are all wedding gifts, you know. And off we go. Got in the car, drove across Montana, drove across British Columbia, went to Prince Rupert, oh, yeah. got on board the Alaskan Marine Highway and took it up for two days, you know, telling my wife, oh, this will be just like, you know, a country club. It'll be great. You know, it wasn't until later that we kind of fell into the country club life. But, you know, even then I still hear about that. But part of us yeah. is young as young men, I can attest to that, that, you know, where where were you going to see the country? The Army sent, you know, me to Fort Sill and then to Fort Lewis and back yeah. and forth. Yeah. I mean, you never would have seen, you never yeah, would have adventure. That. That's exactly you're right, Joe. Exactly what it was. It was a wonderful adventure. We had all the stuff. And it's a great place for newly. Yeah, because it either makes or break, uh, breaks, either makes or breaks. You can't run home to your mom. You can't say, hey, I'm leaving or, hey, get, you know, tap out, give me a timeout. You can't do that. You got to make it work. And we were there for, actually, I extended. We were there for originally four years, and then they said three years. And then, because uh, the, the Army was messing around with the end strength and all that. Oh, yeah. And they finally said, someone said, do you want to command an infantry company as a first lieutenant? And I go, sure. I go, where are all the captains? And they go, they either got rid of them Rift. Oh, the big rift. Yeah, or guys didn't want to do it. You know, they'd already, but we had had guys who were had commanded companies in Vietnam, oh, yeah. and these guys were they'd been twenty year captains. They were wonder, I mean, wonderful, learned men, yeah. very experienced. And you know, so they turned a couple of us. One of one of my friends uh, had 
the Bravo company. I had Alpha Company, 1st Battalion, 60th Infantry, Go Devils. And, you know, we commanded, commanded for 13 months. And I asked my wife, hey, you know, I want to command. I want to do this now. And she said, yep, go ahead. But in between school, in between command and leaving, uh, I want 30 days uh, in Spain because she had studied in Spain. So we went for was 30 she days. Was she a Knox college? She's a Knox grad, oh, two great. years behind me. So when I was finishing grad school, she was finishing Knox and her Spanish was very good. So we went to the Iberian Peninsula for 30 days and then went to the advanced course. At, and you were ahead of your, I mean, you were first lieutenant. First lieutenant, I mean. yeah. I didn't, matter of fact, I never knew when I, I never, I got orders to captain, but this friend of mine said he was in the advanced course ahead of me. And he said, hey, and we were staying with him for about a couple of days and our house was ready. And he says, you do not want to show up at the advanced course as a first lieutenant. You'll get, even for a day, you'll get dumped on. He said, I'm already a captain. I was behind you on the list. So we had a promotion ceremony in his living room the day before I started the advanced course. And you made captain right there in the living room. In the living room. I said, yeah, here, you know, you're, and he says, I'm a captain. I know you're a captain. Yeah. I was behind you on the list. You got to be a captain. He said, you'll get orders later on. Just check to see if you're getting paid. So you come out of the advanced school and then where do you go? Uh, you know, uh, a friend of mine, a real good friend of mine, Eldon Bargewell, who was one of the original Delta guys, he was the branch, he was the infantry branch chief at Fort, uh, at Fort Benning at the time. Uh, and he says, hey, uh, two things. There's a school at the University of Chicago that no one knows about that you're going to go to. And uh, you're going to go to Norwich University, ROTC. I said, how come I can't go command a company? They go, because you already did that. All these other guys, there's like five of us in the advanced course that commanded a company already. And in the advanced course, we just laughed. The guys who commanded companies because we're going, oh, now we're finding out everything we screwed up, everything we should have been doing, we found out in the advanced course. So, you know, we, now we go, hey, now we're ready to go command because we've done it once. Now we want to go fix all this stuff that we broke. And they go, no, nope, can't do that. It is, yeah. it is what it is. And you kind of go, okay. And I start to see, you start seeing the army differently going, okay, I'm a career ca uh, captain now. Let me see where this is going. So they go recruiting ROTC or something else with an R, which I can't remember. Reserve duty. That's it. Reserve Ooh. duty. And I go, okay. So they had a mountain cold weather rescue team and technical climbing team up at Norwich University yeah, in North, Northfield, Vermont. Right. I'm, uh, that's my it's neck in, of the woods. Right I'm, in the middle of Green Mountain. So I yeah. go around, I grew up around Fort Drum. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Cold weather. So exactly. you, you were a cold weather guy, Alaska and now. Alaska uh, and then, yeah, Norwich. And I went there and sure enough, you know, uh, it's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. We we took the Arctic expertise that we had had in Alaska and we applied it, you know, to Vermont. It was wonderful. I mean, it was really good. I, you know, got to coach uh, college football as an aside, but, really? you know, but, but at I know which Academy at Norwich uh, university, Norwich yeah, university yeah. I mean. but it, <clears throat> but it was, uh, it was, it was good. It was a little bit different because we were, we, we, we couldn't fraternize with the students, but we couldn't, we were not old enough to really be full-time faculty. So it was, it was a difficult fit. Luckily we had a real charismatic infantry colonel. And again, I'm still an infantry officer, an infantry colonel named, uh, Jerry Chicala. And if you went to Central Casting and say, give me a barrel chested infantry colonel with, you know, the, the crew cut thing, barrel chested, huge, you know, and this guy played for some guy named Lombardi when he was at West Point back sure. in the fifties. So oh, you yeah. go, okay, this is a real deal. Yeah. Well, yeah. Serious. And he taught me all about fitness and everything I needed to know. And then he tried to get me back in the infantry when I'm leaving Norwich and they go, Hey, you can't go back to an infantry battalion because you've already done it. And you go, what the hell? So I turned to him. I said, you know, the special forces becoming a branch. And I had a bunch of guys that I this had. This is 84. This right? is 84. I'm, I'm running into a bunch of guys at Fort Devens, mm -hmm. you know, second battalion and third battalion are there. Of the 10th? Of the 10th. And, and I'm talking 10th to special them. special forces group. Yep. And I'm talking to them. And the guys I'd run into before, in, in, my, in my estimation, were clowns in special forces. I didn't, I uh, looked at him and I go, wow. David, no, don't take any offense out there. Yeah. Well, no, if, no, no, you, no, you, no, he I, hadn't I, met I, you. He hadn't met if you. Was, he didn't hey, mean you. If it doesn't, if it doesn't fit, don't worry. Yeah, that's right. It, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so I finally, I'm running into these guys from the 10th group and I go, wow, they're professional. They're good. They know their craft. Multilingual. Yep. Yeah, very, very serious about it. And a buddy of mine who had served, had been my executive officer in the infantry company, had been in Lebanon with 10th group. 
Mm. and had been working and came back and told me all about it. And I said, oh, it's intriguing. He says, hey, look, you're going to be very disappointed. Don't do it. You're going to be disappointed. And I said, I'm not sure what you're talking about. And I hear you, but I've talked to these NCO friends of mine that I'm very close with. And every one of them says, look, if you want to help get ready for the next 10 to 20 or 30 years, go into special forces. So it's not that I disregard yours over theirs, I just believe that the NCOs have this right, and they and they know things that they can see into the future as to what they. But in the military at the time, that was a career killer. Well, Going kiss, special forces, kiss of death, kiss of death, kiss of death. You went SF and you were off the grid, right? Yeah. The green was was Bob Mulcahy there at the tenth about the time you were there. Who? Bob Mulcahy was he there? Oh yeah, the yeah, absolutely, there? yeah, yeah. Eighty one, yeah. eighty, eighty one, eighty four. Yeah, and we knew a guy, yeah. uh, Ray Love, lives and, uh, up in uh, up in the mountains here. Bob was my uh, team sergeant on the Mike Force. Oh, yeah. Cox yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. In uh, 68, 69. Great guy. Yeah. He, he did White Star as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, in 62. Sure. Big background. Scuba. Uh, oh, he's just a terrific guy. Still, still stay in touch with him. Yeah. So yeah. our tagline is where the military history meets the future of warfare. So you have gone from the worst in the military, in the in the American Army, in the U.S. Army, yeah. the, those times after Vietnam were horrible. But you were part of the rebuilding process, and then bingo, the special forces becomes a branch, right? And uh, Reagan is transforming the military into a serious fighting machine, right? And um, and everything's coming back together again into a into a wonderful military, yeah. This uh, an all volunteer military, right? This uh, I get a phone call. I had gone to the campus one evening for a pre jump. We used to go down to uh, to Turner Drop Zone down in uh, yeah Turner Drop Zone uh, down at uh, Devons, and we would jump the cadets like we do an airborne operation or two, you know, in the springtime once a year, more for recruiting than anything else. And we had a pre-jump briefing, came back. Kathy's on the phone to somebody. It's again, it's late at night, eight o'clock in the evening, and this guy says, and she goes, "Hey, there's some guy from Branch," and I go. Infantry branch calling me at eight o'clock at night. And I go, what's the deal? And the guy says, Hey, this is a uh, Carrie Cray, Captain Cray. I'm your, you know, branch manager or whatever. Hey, uh, I see you put in for special forces. I go, yeah. He says, well, do you, uh, do you want to go? Uh, are, you, are you still interested? I said, I am. And he says, do you want to go to Fort Lewis? And I asked Kathy, I said, Hey, you want to go to Fort Lewis, Washington? She had just been out there. I'd never been out there. She'd been out there visiting friends. And she said, Oh yeah. She said, but I thought first, I thought first special forces, because the wives always know this stuff. I thought they were going to be in uh, Hawaii. And the guy says, no, nah, no, nah, he overheard, no, nah, no, nah, they're not going to Hawaii, Okinawa and Fort Lewis. Do you want to go to Fort Lewis? And I said, yeah. And then he says, do you want to go to July class? And I go, you've given me all three of my first choices. First, you know, first special forces group, first group training in, in July in Fort Lewis. And then I go, hey, wait a minute. Who the f is this? Yeah, right. <laughs> I said, because back then in, in, in the 80s, we were still producing fake orders for people and screwing with people. Yeah. We, we, still had a, we still had a sense of humor. So I'm going, <laughs> which one of my buddies puts you up to this? And he says, no, no, no. I said, well, why are you calling me at 8 o'clock at home? He said, because all of your asshole buddies bug me to get out of shit that they don't want to go to or to go places they're not going to be able to go to during the duty days. I've got a rec. He, he's getting pissed. I got a requisition to fill and I'm giving you all three of your first choices. If you don't want them, fine. You ever think this is going to happen again? And I go, I got it. I got it. He says, now listen, and he's a little bit, I knew who he was, little bitty guy, you know, but it didn't matter. He had the power and he says, you need to take a PT test. You need to take a swim test. You need to get a physical and you need to have this done. And I'm going to send you that car. And I said, Hey, I got it. I'm writing notes now. I said, got it. Thanks. All first three choices. He said, yep, you're getting exactly what I'm telling you. You're going, are you good with that? I said, I'm fine. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Now being the trusting soul that I, I am, that was like Thursday. We did a jump, came back, called branch on Monday to see if the guy really worked there or not. <laughs> and he did. I mean, he trusting did. soul that you, well, are. you know, trust but verify. Come on, Reagan, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, listen, we're going to have to take a short break here, but uh, we're going to come back uh, with more uh, on the spooky side of uh, special operations, and we'll find out what uh, General uh, Fridovich can tell us. Uh, we'll be back in about uh, three minutes. Stay tuned. <laughs> Everyone 
everyone's going to need an attorney at some point in their life. I'm no different. Hey everyone, it's James from Vets On. Whether it was my last will and testament before deployment or my ongoing custody battle for my children during my divorce, I needed help, so I lawyered up. If you need help, I urge you to contact Capstrom Law Firm. Capstrom Law Firm in Springfield, Missouri services clients throughout the state in criminal law, personal injury, and family law. With over 13 years practicing law, Tom Capstrom understands both law and court procedures and how stressful they can be. Let Tom Capstrom Law Firm and his dedicated staff take the stress and worry out of a difficult situation by calling him today. We feel so strongly about the work that Tom and his staff are doing that he'll be a monthly guest on the show. Tom is a veteran and a listener, for God's sake, so you know the guy is solid and will fight for you. Give Tom a call today by calling 417-864-0552. Or email Tom at capstromlaw.com. And don't forget to tell him that Vets On sent you. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertising. If you or someone you know is looking for a new job or career, you need to visit the pros. National Career Fairs at ncfairs.com. National Career Fairs hosts over 300 career fairs a year nationwide. The events are free and give you the perfect chance to meet some of the top employers in your area face-to-face. To To find the nearest career fair to you, visit ncfairs.com. Again, that's ncfairs.com. What are you waiting for? Veterans served us, now it's time we serve them. As a veteran of Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as a current military member deployed abroad, I would like to take a minute of your time to tell you about Patriot Hills of New York. Patriot Hills of New York is a nonprofit organization providing support to veterans and their families. They partner veterans in need with over 65 health and wellness organizations, community groups, as well as philanthropic foundations providing no or low cost services. They've helped over 400 veterans through confidential referral services, assistance with veterans issues, employment placement, as well as educational opportunities. If you need assistance or just want to help veterans by donating your time or services, contact them at info at patriothills.org. Again, that's info at patriothills.org. Visit patriothillsofnewyork.com for more information about their services or how you can donate. Our veterans deserve no less. We can give it to them and you can help. You're listening to the Veterans Heritage Hour on the Vets on Media Network. Welcome back to the Veterans Heritage Hour with uh, Lieutenant General David Friedovich, the highest ranking Green Beret when he retired in 19, uh, 2011. General, welcome back and uh, take us back now to Fort Lewis. You're there with a Special Forces unit, the first Special Forces group. Um, where did you deploy from there? What was going on at Fort Lewis back yeah, then? Yeah, it was uh, 1984. They'd been reactivated. They had flagged up in 72 in Okinawa when Vietnam was winding down. Mm-hmm. The first group. Yep. So they cased the colors, but they kept them. And they reactivated it in like September of 84. We got out there in Thanksgiving, right around uh, Thanksgiving of 84. And they had broken, they had front loaded the 1st Battalion, 1st Special Forces in Okinawa, Tory Station. They had built those guys up with uh, pretty much two full companies for the battalion and were starting to make the the third company. And the other two battalions, 2nd and 3rd, the 1st group, uh, had two companies each, Alpha and Bravo. Uh, I showed up ahead of, we drove, we showed up ahead of the curve because I knew they had like, five or six classmates still got the from, Volkswagen yeah yeah uh well, no I think we I think traded we, up we tr- transitioned to a Datsun 200 <laughs> right. or something it was a hatchback so we carried a we carried a lot of stuff uh, still no kids you know Kathy and I uh, still happily married and you know again as you could tell I, I asked her about things as sure. we went you know uh hey I want to go to special she didn't quite get what that meant which was good for me sure. but uh we get out to Fort Lewis and they are looking for gear that the ninth ID is throwing away and first corps is getting rid of and ninth infantry division. Ninth infantry. They, it was just a long haul to get all the things that we needed. So, you know, we had a pretty dynamic uh see Dave Barato, Colonel Barato was our group commander and Richard Todd was our uh third battalion's uh first group's battalion commander. And he was a big PT stud. So he said, Hey, look. You know, if you can't do anything else, because we were still waiting for rifles and everything that we're supposed to have. And mm-hmm. he says, hey, practice your navigation, put a heavy pack on your back, and 
you know, so we had to do a six miler every other day, well, rucksack Fort march at Fort Lewis. And Lewis, as you know, is not flat. I was know? stationed there with the third yeah. armored cavalry regiment. Yeah. Before I went to Vietnam. But you got the ride. We, yeah. We were walking, yeah. you know, jumping or walking. So, you know, it ain't flat, nor is it dry. No, no, it's true. True. Uh, so, you know, we're there and the group commander Barado says at a Halen farewell one time early on, he says, well, what I did, and this is in front of the second battalion commander and some of the staff, because we did things together quite a bit back then. And we drank together. How about that? I love that. Yeah, we drank that. together. Yeah. That was my army. Yeah. And it's still mine. But <laughs> he said, you know, I fronted and loaded the talent in third group, third battalion. This is with the second battalion commander sitting there. How would you feel about that? But what he also did was, and, he, and Brado's a very strategic thinking guy. We're still good friends. Uh, he said, I drew a line from Okinawa south and Okinawa north. And so you have Northeast Asia, you have Southeast Asia. And he says, you've got 1st Battalion, 1st Group doing a lot of engagement with Thailand and the rest of it. And we always had a primary and a secondary country. So my primary country was the Philippines. My secondary country was Thailand. Mm -hmm. And then you had two more like, like places you'd probably never get to, you know, maybe Laos, maybe Vietnam at mm -hmm. the time, but you had to study and do your area assessments. So we had the Philippines and I walked in, didn't sign in yet. I walked in somewhere and they go, Hey, you need to go see this guy, a company commander down in, uh, in uh, third battalion. I go to B one eighty, which is Bravo company, third battalion, first group. And Joe Rozak is there. Here's a real seasoned guy who had helped in the Liberian workups. So he'd been a first, a fifth group guy, had been a commander in uh, the 82nd, was really squared away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he, we sat down like this for about four hours and we talked right out of the uh, Q course, talked about the Q course in detail. That's the qualifying course well, for special for forces, forces. Yeah. special forces. And, you know, after about actually quite honestly, three hours, he picks up the phone and he calls the adjutant, uh, the guy in charge of orders at group. And he says, Hey, I've got this captain in front of me. He's assigned to my company. He's actually, this is, this is him talking about me. He said, he's excellent. I want him. He's coming to my company, cut the orders, hangs the phone up. And I said, that's that. He said, yeah, you work here now. He didn't check with your wife, Kathy. No, he just, he no. just did it. Well, huh? this is the guy, this is, this is a classic guy. He's had his dog longer than he's had any one of his wives. Okay. All right. And you know, he was married to the third Mrs. Rozak at the time. Mm -hmm. And he's on number four right now, which is usually a record. At that point, you kind of learn to live with what you got. And sure. that's what he did. Uh -huh. so they're never going to hear this, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a bad assumption on my part. Oh, oh man, yeah. they'll oh, be yeah, dragging this one down. So yeah. Yeah, right. well, good. Okay. Okay. That's good to hear. Anyway. So you spent a lot of time then in the Philippines. Well, the Philippines. Place. And, and we, we, the first thing that Rozak, Joe Rozak and I worked on with this really classic 10 special forces groups command company, Sergeant major a guy named, you know, Rick Riley, mm -hmm. he was classic white haired Irishman older than us, but, and very, very well seasoned in trade craft and everything. I mean, again, taught us a huge amount. We were getting ready to do a bear base, go to the Philippines and live for seven or eight weeks in the jungles with them. We built the base out of nothing in the Philippines, in the Philippines. We brought everything with us. We had next to no money. We finally had parachutes and rifles and the rest of it. And we put together a seven week training period with these guys with the Filipino, with the Filipino special forces constabulary, uh -huh. constabulary and uh, the uh, special forces. We, I think we had 790 some, uh, parachute jumps with one injury. Wow. We had, I mean, it was phenomenal amount of stuff that we did. Uh, and we did it all ourselves with just a B team, about seven or eight guys on the team, put this whole training package together for our company, six full teams, uh, and all of the Filipinos. Was this relationship building or were you actually gearing up for a mission? We were, we were helping them do two things. One relationship building. Always, you always get that at. We got access to the area we hadn't been in in a long time. It was um, Fort Macese. Now, it was made easier because this is 1986 and uh, uh, Clark Air Base is still open. Mm -hmm. So about a 30-minute Huey ride back to Clark, 
and you can get people in and out, you know, and get stuff very easily in sure. there. So we, we hopped across from Fort Lewis, McCord. Uh, I think we went to Narita and then down from Narita into uh, Clark. Did you have your own air assets? No, you? we didn't. No. So you had we to did. depend on the Army or the Air Force? Yeah, or Air something? Force there. So, but we had figured all that out beforehand. And we had tons of uh, C 130 help. So we had really good vanilla C 130s, mm -hmm. slicks, you know, mm -hmm. helping us out. So, again, but we also were helping them get ready because their biggest threat at the time was the New People's Army of the Communist Party of the Philippines. Okay. They were still, and, you know, that, the, the communists, which, you know, they're still there, uh, kind of rise and, and, and ebb based on uh, how corrupt the Philippine government is. So you had Marcos. Well, so that was 85, 86. We go back there now. Rosak's no longer there. I, I get the company. It's a major's position. I get the company as a captain. Mm -hmm. You see a, a, sure. a trend here. But you've been, been ahead of the curve the whole time. Yeah, a little, well, a little bit. I never got paid for any of that stuff. It didn't really matter. You don't do any of this stuff for the pay. Sure. You do it because they allow you to do missions like this. So we're putting together a training program for an entire battalion to help train them to go kill NPA in, on northern Luzon. Because we also knew that there were Soviet advisors that were working the Spesnet, other side of it. The yeah, guys. Or doing the same thing we were doing. So this is another bit of a proxy war that the Cold War had kind of fun. I think, David, you ran into a Spesnets guy in Vietnam, didn't you? David Lucer? I'm sorry. Hopefully you didn't lose him. Um, but he ran into a Spesnets guy leading yeah. a, a North Vietnamese Army group in Vietnam. Yeah, actually, our, 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 our intel officer came to us right when we were getting ready to go there, and he says, hey, you know, we have just found out that there's a Spetsnaz, a Russian, a Soviet-supported bar right downtown near you, where you guys stay. And they used to, you know, at least open that stuff up. Sure. So he says, whatever you do, don't go in there. Well, that's the first thing you did. That's right? exactly what we did. You know? <laughs> Joe, yeah. he answered your question. It was yes. Okay. I think the first guy you, you encountered in a firefight was a six foot two Spesnets guy. His boots were bigger than mine. Yeah, it didn't, <laughs> it was, didn't it was, quite fit in. Yeah. I met a Spesnets guy. I worked in Kharkov, Ukraine later on. And yeah. the head of the school district yeah. in Kharkov was a Spesnets guy. Six foot two, great looking guy, wonderful guy. And he was saying he was in uh, Angola. Yeah, right. yeah, and there was our special forces same were in that same deal. So same he says deal. they would fight each other during the day, and then this green berets and, and, the and they'd drink and together drink. and get. And he would he would go like you know he had the symbol for getting drunk, and it was great camaraderie. And he loved me because I was a veteran. Uh, that was a lot yeah. of bonding there. So I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So we go to the bar, and sure enough, it's got subsidized beer. Beer is about a buck cheaper, and it's almost like they're giving it away. Well, they're communists, you know? right? They have well, yeah, to. Give they it have away. to give it away. <laughs> so I mean, so of course, you know. As soon as this guy says, don't go there, we go there. Yeah. You know, we, we came back and we said, hey, that's a great tip. Any other places <laughs> you want to tell us not to go to? But, but, while, but while we were there, sure enough, we, we literally, this is, I don't think I've ever said much of this publicly. We are going out to Fort McSaysa when we're putting together this package. And I've got my training NCO with me, a guy named, he was a Sergeant First Class Bobby Ware, Special Forces guy. We're going out there. We're putting together the ranges. We know what we want to do, getting all of it ready to go. And sure enough, uh, we we run into the scout rangers in their vehicles and with a guy named Gringo Hanasan. Are these our guys, scout rangers? No, they're theirs. They're guys. Theirs, but they're – and this guy, Gringo Hanasan, is a uh, one of their Philippine Military Academy grads, had been a senator or was going to be a senator, but he was putting together that weekend a coup. Ah. And we were leaving. and as Against we, the Marcos regime. Yeah. And as we're leaving, uh, I'm flying out. And as by the time I fly out, Bobby Ware is still there. And I go, I get a hold of him. I said, whatever you do, do not go back out there because somebody's going to put it together that we were there with them while this was going on, that we got a piece of that. You need to stay low. You're supposed to be there for a week. Stay low and get your ass out of there. No matter where you go to, just leave. So you're not part of this. And this thing became the walk on the EDSA where it failed, but about, I think almost a year now, a little bit later, sure enough, Corey Aquino comes in and sure. she takes over and they have this very peaceful, uh, yeah, very peaceful. Really peaceful. Yeah. Relatively speaking, yeah. but, but it was, uh, 
it's when they had to airlift via C-141, uh, the Marcos family. Just to get their shoes out. They needed a C-41. Actually, get... probably two of them <laughs> to get out, uh, and they, they dropped them off in Hawaii wow. at Hickam Air Force Base. And sure. that's where I think they lived out most of their month. I think most of their lives. Sure. But right around that time, we were putting together a training package. So when the coup went down the second time, we were on the ground at McSaysa, and they call us, and they go, hey, you guys want to come out? We go, no. We've got ammunition. We've got a training program. These guys are great. It was the 65th Infantry we were working with, and they were going to go kill Communist North. you know. And we said, no, nope, these guys are good. We're staying with them. Besides, we had an evacuation plan. We had a destruction plan. We had an escape plan. And even though Clark was now closed, uh, we could get to Clark. Mm -hmm. uh, but So we were wasn't closed yet. We were in very, very good shape. We said, no, there's no reason for us. We have a mission. We have everything. And Dave would tell you, Lucier would tell you that, uh, you know, you have a mission. You have everything you need. Why would you leave? Sure. And the answer is we wouldn't leave. And my, my boss on the other end of the SATCOM said, hey, and he wasn't of the same. He's a special forces guy, but now of the same ilk. You know, we were very driven at sure. the time, as you might imagine. He said, are you sure the families are worried? Just I go, hey, just tell the families that you talk to us. We'll talk every night if you want to have a fireside chat like this. But we're good. We're, we're better than good. You know, you know, we are we're very happy to be here and we'll finish it up. Why, why roll it up? And it just took a while, but my biggest fear in all of this is that we were going to, we were going to have to somehow be hitched to the earlier Hanasan attempt. And that put him, what happened with him is it put him on the run. He finally came back, escaped off some prison ship in Manila Bay, yeah. literally escaped, came back and for some, they gave him amnesty. For was some he a reason. rebel leader? Was he a communist? He was, he was, no, no, he was, he was not a rebel leader. He was a, just a leader, one of their, okay. you know, they do this every now and then. Sure. And he ends up becoming a senator. I think he's still around. Wow. I don't know if he's in the Senate, you know, so they're very forgiving over there. Well, isn't very, for, yeah, very forgiving. So very your good. mission changed from, from, from anti-communist to anti-Islamic terrorist or anti-Islamic front. Movement. You know, yeah, yeah. A couple things happened from uh, 86, 87 when we, when we engaged there. Pinatubo blew up, the volcano sure. blew up and, and took out Clark. Mm -hmm. And they, we go, and we had been to go, I think Richard Armitage had been negotiating sure. with them. And he said, okay, you guys are trying to, it's, it's blackmail. We'll move everything to, to Guam. And they moved all of QB Point and, uh, and Subic, the naval port, part to, uh, to Opera Harbor in Guam. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, the air base went to Anderson and that was it. And they closed it all up and you go, wow. So, Five years later, that was 93 to 95 and over it in a real beat up uh, UH-1H that they had that I had. I was a lieutenant colonel at Special Ops Command Pacific. I was a staff officer there and we were flying around. And you wound up general. being the commander of that command. Yeah, a couple of years later, many years later. Yeah. And uh, we're flying around with my general, General uh, Brigadier General uh, Ron Rokas. Uh, and we're flying around and all you could see were the tops, the lahar, the mud. And the, uh, and the volcanic ash had just covered almost the entire base. And we'd given it back to them. And that was 93, 95, five years later. Yeah, I'm the first Special Forces Group commander. It's now the year 2000. All of the IMET money that we've wow, given what's them. What's IMET? It's international uh, money. It's for training. It's for education and training. Sure, okay. So from, all, from our U.S. government to, to their government. To the, uh, all of that money had, had run out. And all the things we had given them had run out. And Admiral uh, Dennis Blair was the uh, commander of Pacific Command, SINGPAC, at the time. And he said, hey, look, uh, I'm going to give him one more shot. He had about $2 million of commander uh, uh, engagement funds that he was going to give to first special forces group and have them train a company and this company was going to be a JSOC like a Delta like for sure. and we started to kind of get much closer to them because we'd spent five years apart. We sure. hadn't done much. All of the joint combined exchanges for training, the JSITs that we do, we were doing more in Thailand and other countries that were opening up. In Indonesia too, right? In Indonesia. <laughs> yeah. The country had closed off to us. So we said, okay, fine. And, we found them and we started working the light ready uh, reaction company and they were, we selected them, what put through, through the training and they were becoming very, very good. And right when this was going on, 
I get a call from the uh, special ops commander, uh, Brigadier General at the time, Donnie Wooster, Sockback Commander. He said, hey, we want you, can you do, on behalf of Admiral Blair, a top-to-bottom assessment, strategic, operational, tactical assessment of the Philippine Army, Armed Forces, because at this time they had at least two or three hostages. Mm-hmm. They had uh, uh, Gracia and Martin Burnham. They had Deborah Yap, a Filipina nurse. They had Oscar Guillermo, Jeffrey Schilling. This guy walked into one of their camps and walked back out. But the Abu Sayyaf group, as part of uh, supposedly Al Qaeda, and I believe they had you know, relationships with them and with Jamal Islamia from Mm -hmm. Banda Aceh in Indonesia, uh, they had been working together and they had been doing a lot of kidnapping for ransom Mm -hmm. and, you know, wholesale killing and terrorizing the Southern Philippines. Well, in all my years in the Philippines, we only really set foot up north on Luzon Mm -hmm. because we were doing the communist, the NP, New People's Army. Now we're invited to go south. So Admiral Blair has asked me to come in has asked me to come in and, and he was getting ready to give me guidance and we can do that in just a minute. Sure. The Birdman has just given us a signal. We're going to take a short break, but we're going to come back with uh, the uh, battle against Abu Sarif and uh, the Philippines. And uh, we'll get to uh, the general's role as he was a deputy uh, commander of special operations command. Stay tuned. Veterans served us. Now it's time we serve them. As a veteran of Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as a current military member deployed abroad, I would like to take a minute of your time to tell you about Patriot Hills of New York. Patriot Hills of New York is a nonprofit organization providing support to veterans and their families. They partner veterans in need with over 65 health and wellness organizations, community groups, as well as philanthropic foundations providing no or low cost services. They've helped over 400 veterans through confidential referral services, assistance with veterans issues, employment placement, as well as educational opportunities. If you need assistance or just want to help veterans by donating your time or services, contact them at info at patriothills.org. Again, that's info at patriothills.org. Visit patriothillsofnewyork.com for more information about their services or how you can donate. Our veterans deserve no less. We can give it to them and you can help. Everyone's going to need an attorney at some point in their life. I'm no different. Hey, everyone, it's James from Vets On. Whether it was my last will and testament before deployment or my ongoing custody battle for my children during my divorce, I needed help, so I lawyered up. If you need help, I urge you to contact Capstrom Law Firm. Capstrom Law Firm in Springfield, Missouri, services clients throughout the state in criminal law, personal injury, and family law. With over 13 years practicing law, Tom Capstrom understands both law and court procedures and how stressful they can be. Let Tom Capstrom Law Firm and his dedicated staff take the stress and worry out of a difficult situation by calling him today. We feel so strongly about the work that Tom and his staff are doing that he'll be a monthly guest on the show. Tom is a veteran and a listener, for God's sake, so you know the guy is solid and will fight for you. Give Tom a call today by calling 417-864-0552. Or email Tom at capstromlaw.com. And don't forget to tell him that Vets On sent you. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely upon advertising. If you or someone you know is looking for a new job or career, you need to visit the pros. National Career Fairs at ncfairs.com. National Career Fairs hosts over 300 career fairs a year nationwide. The events are free and give you the perfect chance to meet some of the top employers in your area face-to-face. To To find the nearest career fair to you, visit ncfairs.com. Again, that's ncfairs.com. What are you waiting for? You're listening to the Veterans Heritage Hour on the Vets on Media Network. Welcome back. We're with General uh, David Friedovich. The, um, we're talking Green Berets. General, let's get back to uh, your command in the Philippines uh, or, or the Pacific region for uh, Special Operations Command. The yeah, at, the, at that point, I'm, uh, I'm the first Special Forces Group commander, and uh, we're getting ready to go do this assessment for Admiral Blair. Uh, from top to bottom, because as his as his point was, I'm tired of giving them trucks that they drive till they're uh, till they're dead, ships that they run aground, airplanes they don't maintain. I'm tired of giving them things. 
I want to find out what's going on. Can you go there and do it? And, and this is this is strictly and only a group like the special forces can do this. Correct? Yeah, because you know he asked me. I said, you know, why'd you pick me? He said, why'd you pick us? He said, because one, I know you. I know what you guys are capable of doing, and you can figure it out in no time. And we t we told him how we were going to do, it, and he said, that's exactly why. He says, are you going to get on the island? Because he was worried about the hostages. Are sure. you going to get on the island, Basilan? And I said, hey, sir, time and reconnaissance is never time wasted. And I said, I'll get on the island. He said, what if they won't let you? I said, I will get on the island. He said, well, how do you do it? I said, well, we'll have all the trading material in the world. We'll have whiskey, scotch. We, we'll have packs. We'll have Marlboros and cartons. And we'll have money. No Salem's man. Salem's. No, 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 no. They were Marlboros. What a lightweight. What a lightweight. Well, I, this is Vietnam, like the Salem's. So, uh, so what we, you know, and he looked at me and he said, I said, we'll pay for, we might have to get this boat by gunpoint, but we will pay our way to and from the island and we'll take care of, we'll see what we need to see. And he kicked back in his chair and Wooster sitting there, you know, my, my one-star boss, just kind of white knuckling, cringing, like, what did you just tell him? I said, I told him how we're going to do it. And the admiral, the good admiral, kicks back and he says, yeah, that's exactly what I thought. You you guys will figure it out. I go, yes, sir, we'll figure it out and we'll get there. And you did. Yeah, and we did. And he, he also said, hey, look, leverage my four stars if you need them. I said, I know what you mean. I said, I will. He said, but let me tell you one thing. You don't have a checkbook. I said, I understand what that means. Don't make promises you can't keep. You don't have anything you can give them. I said, I'm very good with that. Got it. That was on the 10th of September, 2001. Wow. 11 September hits where I'm, I'm living, I'm in the BO, the VO, the, the, the distinguished visiting quarters on uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh -huh. For some reason I get up in the morning, it's around two something oh. Hawaii time. I go, what the hell? Why is that tower smoking? Yeah. And then I go, what the fuck is that? And you see the other plane come in. And, and like all of us, you're sort of stunned. Yeah. I pick up the phone. I have my two with me and my threes with me mm -hmm. and my sergeant major. And I go, Hey, he said, and my two, a uh, great guy, Ed DeSantis. I said, Ed, did you just see that? He said, sir, I did. He said, we're into the shit now. I said, yeah, we are. And I think almost all special forces guys, cause we'd hung around with guys like Pete Shoemaker. who was sure. chief staff of the army and yeah. JSOC and a uh, sink sock. You know, we all sort of knew something was coming. We just didn't know what, now we knew what. And you go, okay, here we go. So, you know, it, all it did was speed up the assessment. We finally, after about five days, we grabbed a KC-135 tanker, took us back from Hawaii to Fairchild. My guys picked up, came back, and we got mission ready. We spent the next, uh, probably that was mid-September, we spent from September to early October getting ready. And we then we went in there very in a very clandestine way, very quietly went in there told everybody what we were going to do, told them how we were going to do it, had a team of about 26 people, hand-selected, and we did a total assessment, and we got great access. They knew we were coming. They opened up the doors for us, and we went from Manila and the headquarters there all the way down to Southern Command, and we met a guy named as a three-star general, Lieutenant General Roy Samatu. He welcomed us with open arms, gave us everything we needed, got us on the island. We got to see and shoot with these guys, got to look at their weapons, got to talk to them. And we did what we'd say was the observer controller mission, meaning we observed things, we recorded it. We made nothing subjective. It was all objective. Came back and then goes, here's a report. As we told everybody on the way out, we back briefed everybody. And we, we modified the severity of it based on because the, the, uh, the Philippine colonels, they wanted, we don't need you, we just need your equipment. We go, no, you don't even need our equipment. Everything you need, you have right now to win this fight. You just don't know how to do it. Didn't want to hear that. Samatu, the three-star who owned all these colonels goes, David, we will, and I don't go by David, I go by Frito. And he says, I think he's calling me Frito by then. He says, Frito, we will see you and your men back here. And we had no idea we were getting the mission, none. We weren't shopping. We brief everybody. The last person we brief is Admiral Blair. We brief him and he gets it and he goes, okay, so what's it going to take? And I, and I turned to my running partner, in this case, it's, it's Lieutenant Colonel, now Colonel retired David Maxwell, wonderfully brilliant doctrinaire in Special Forces. He was the first battalion commander in Okinawa at the time, so I brought him forward with me. And Blair looks at me and says, so what's it going to take to do this mission? And I go, what mission? He said, this looks like a mission for you guys. It's unconventional in foreign internal defense. It's yours. 
he says, what's it going to take? And I look at Maxwell again and I shrug and I go, give me the slide. We took the slide out and we said, here's two task organizations. I said, the obvious, and I turned it around for the admiral. I said, sir, the obvious one is this is larger. With a larger force over time, it'll take less time. With a smaller force to the slide on the left, it'll take more time, less force, less exposure. And I said, and the obvious choice is you start big and go small. There too. So there's three courses of action in front of you. He said, how long? And I said, realistically, with a large force, seven to 10 years. And he goes, go get ready. And he had a huge smile on his face. He said, go get ready. So we left and we had the mission. And we went back to, from there, back to Fort Lewis. That's now the 4th of November. And we spent from November until uh, early December getting guys ready. And we actually put forces on, uh, on Basilan. And we were there to help change the dynamic of the environment down there. And that's your job around the world. Around the world. And it was also to help get back the Americans that were held hostage. And around, right around June 2002, we finally tracked them down, got in, the guy got, the uh, scout rangers got in a firefight with the Abu Sayyaf group. Uh, somebody killed Martin Burnham. He knew, he'd already knew he was going to die that day. He told, he told his wife that for some mm -hmm. reason. Uh, Deborah Yap, I think, was killed as well. And Gracia Burnham survived. She was shot in the I leg and, and we, we brought her out. I mean, and at that time, my sergeant major was no longer Hoopy Qualls. He'd gone on to a different job. It was Jody Nacy. Jody Nacy had been a, uh, an operator in Delta. And he said, when we brought everybody back and things calmed down, we weren't through with the mission yet. He turns to me and he says, you know what? That's a successful hostage rescue. That's more than I can say that we've ever done in Delta. And you go, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. oh, that's an interesting insight. We didn't quit there. It was about changing the environment. And we stayed there. And it's just now, here it's 2015. Now the mission is finally winding down. It's probably two or three years past its time because mm -hmm. we really set about task organization sure. about 12, about 12 years. So then we were there. you move from this command into the deputy commander of special operations command. And now we're in this big war in the Middle East. And, yep. and, and, and your command had underneath it special forces, Delta, SEALs. The whole, everything. Everything yeah, was everything. underneath your Everything, command. yeah. Now, there's there's two pieces to that. <clears throat> okay. There's two pieces of that. One, and I'll be as quick as possible. Well, we want to get you back here, man. Yeah. Okay. One is the operational piece, uh -huh. and that's really to run through JSOC. The other part is that we provide and we make ready all of those forces in their uniqueness with their equipment and selection and assessment and all those things that young men want to go to. We do that part. So from the time a guy is a soldier to the time he becomes a Green Beret and becomes a Delta or a Ranger and becomes a Delta operator, it's all under U.S. Special Operations Command. So, but the operational piece of it used to be, used to be under JSOC. Now it's an operational headquarters because now U.S. SOCOM, and this is a recent change to the Unified Command Plan, mm -hmm. SOCOM now owns all the theater special operations commands before the theaters owned them. That's a dynamic change that they're still the working through. The theater meetings like Southern Command. Southern Command owns South, so South, uh, Sox South. Yes. Okay. I was owned by. Central Command has the Middle East. Yeah. In, in, uh, Paycom owns Sock Pack. Sure. Not anymore. Operationally they do, but they don't when it comes to overall who's operating what now that now belongs to us socom that's a dynamic change so we're running out of time here we got to yeah. have you back jim and we will but can you talk about the fine men and women who are under in that command and what it takes to join and, and uh yeah that's that's easy i mean because we're blessed by having these people and you know fighting for the united states of america you're, you're absolutely correct and, and i don't <laughs> think that's an understatement at all i, I really don't I, I believe that you know it's First thing, they select themselves to go. Sure. So first they've joined and they volunteered for the military. Then they select themselves for more training. And there might be nothing more than jump school. Right. But then they select themselves to go do other things because they want to contribute at a much higher level. Sure. And they want to be, most of them, most of them can be trusted because, I mean, trusted and you can have confidence in what they're going to do. So you give somebody a mission and they go, I got the mission. They come back and they said, hey, sir, you gave me the mission. But in, in doing the mission, we also had to add this, 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 and this. And we go, did you just, did you recognize that or did you do it? And they go, no, no, we did it. The whole point of us being like this is to tell me what you want me to do. Give me what I need to do it. Get out of the way and let me, let me surprise you every time. And, you know, success, anything but success, 
you know, that's the only option you have. Is to be successful. Success yeah. is the, is the it, goal. It's the goal. It's the goal. And, and, you, and, and to go beyond what you've told me to do, if you're able to do that. And, and, and they are. Stephen Ambrose uh, once yeah. said that uh, World War II was uh, the children of tyranny uh, fighting against the children of a democracy. And I don't think anything represents that more than special operations where yeah. people are left on their own devices to achieve lofty goals to be successful sure so as a senior leader it's my job to give them what they need and to, and to define what success looks like and to keep their mouth shut afterward correct um, yeah, that's no, yeah tough. That's, that's, it is it is so but, what do you what do you well, think about 20 years anyway yes yeah um, <laughs> so what do you think about these the people talking about who shot who bin laden or all that aren't aren't the delta forces uh uh supposed to keep all that quiet and we only got one minute i'm told the thing I would say to that is, you know, as we said during the break, you know, everybody believes they know who shot bin Laden, and that's from the SEAL community. Mm. And that, that seems to be part of their culture. And I would ask many people to say, okay, who brought in Noriega? One. Who brought in Saddam Hussein? Two. And the answer is you don't know. And even if you do know, you don't talk about it. Why? Because the people who did that come from a different culture and background. The reason, the way you know in special forces, whether you're successful or not, is not whether you talk about it or not, it's whether you get more missions. Uh, and we're never short on missions. I'll leave it at that. I got you covered. General, what a treat having you on this show. My pleasure, Joe. Really this is the Veterans it. Heritage Hour. We need to have you back. We got to come back. And listen, we're, we're planning a, a, a rendezvous of, of former guests, including Jim Kelsey and... Yeah. Uh, General Flynn and uh, like and uh, the OC. honorable OC the honorable not so, so we much, not we're, so much. And, we're, and we're planning that uh, with uh, with uh, Arizona State University. Listen, next week we have a great guest. It's March Madness, and my dear friend, Coach Frank Layden from Niagara University, uh, the Utah Jazz, the former general manager, will be with us. And uh, interestingly enough, what's he have to do with the Veterans Heritage Hour? Well, he has a commission as an infantry officer from the Benning School for Boys. So uh, we'll be talking to you next week. And after that, we have Peter Lucere and a woman by the name of Joanna Swat who will talk about uh, their experiences in the Marine Corps uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan. We're going to hear from our current veterans. Thank you so much for listening. Stay tuned, and uh, we'll see you next week. Veterans Heritage Hour. Thank you so much.